want to start off with sharing the screen with you. What I want to do is we're going to do two things. Today, we're supposed to talk about the one to four family contract and the addenda that goes with that um, or may go with that. And it's not just the one to four family contract. In this business, the way Trek has the promulgated form set up, which are the which is the contracts, um, the one to four family contract is the base for all other residential contracts. And there's six contracts, um, and they're all they all work on the foundation of the one to four family, which is why we use it for almost all the classes and everything else we use not just within the company, but for uh, advanced classes like GRI, GRI and, and so forth. The, um, and there's a difference, there's a difference between the promulgated forms and additional forms. Uh, so for example, Texas Realtors has a lot of other forms that have been added to the system and, and the promulgated forms are with Texas Realtors, but there's additional forms to go with that. And in some cases, there may be other versions, but not with the actual promulgated contracts. And we'll start with that portion of it if we could. If you have any questions, just unmute and jump in. I want to share with you, um, I'm going to share with you a couple of things, and then we'll jump into the contract itself and filling it out and answering questions and, and going through that aspect of it here. Uh, real quick as well. So I'm going to share the screen with you. And what I want to start off with is, is texasrealestate.com. It's Texas Realtors website. And, and let me show you the reason why I want to do that is, first off, if you log in, uh, and if you are a realtor, you have access to this. And this is what I was getting at earlier. This right here in the right-hand corner, that zip form, there's, there's a complete zip form account there, but that's with the, that's the benefit of Texas Realtors. It's our benefit from Texas Realtors, but it's not the company one. So there, and there, so there is a difference. So please don't use it uh, because you'll also find there's a difference in, if you go in and mess with it, there's a difference in, what's available in there. And it looks different than what ours does on the company level. So, but just know that it's there. I use it to, to play around with. I use it sometimes for classes outside of the company and different things um, because it has the standard zip form look uh, to it. One of the, um, the other thing I wanted to do is when you click on this for realtor members, we're dealing with the one of four family contract and addenda, right? So I want to go right here underneath legal and ethics. And again, if you have anything, just unmute and jump in. But underneath legal and ethics, there's forms here. And one of the things, one of the things we try to do is stay up to date with what's going on and, and how things are working and why they work, and et cetera. So if you'll come down here where it has review um, changes, you have that in here. If there's any proposed changes or recently adopted ones, you can click on those. You can see what's under, uh, what they have there. Texas Realtors offers the forms available so you can take a look at them. And again, where we went to was all we did was we went to legal and ethics, went to forms. And if you scroll down to the bottom of it, if you scroll down to the bottom of it, it has uh, form changes. And my reason for showing you this is so that when somebody says a form is changed, or changing, you can go in here and take a look at them. Um, here's the adopted form changes. And here's some of the difference. So this is like, for example, the one to four family uh, contract changed. This was September of last year, but then there's the change for the November uh, portion of it. And let me sh show you what, and this is why I'm showing this to you. Everybody see the PDF version on their screen? Yes. Okay, thanks, Vanessa. Appreciate it. Yes. So the reason I'm showing this to you is because when we took look, take a look at adopted form versions, this happened last year in September. It was because of the legislative changes. The state legislature said we need to do this. 
and that involved the uh, public utility, public improvement districts. So they required a change in our contracts immediately. That's not the way this normally works. Normally they'll make the change and then Trek has time to react to it and, and that's given us time. That didn't happen. This had to be done like now. So Trek put these forms out, but if you look on the form in the upper right-hand corner, that's the promulgated date. So every contract we should be working with now should have 11-8 or 11-10-21 on it. Uh, the, when, they, when they put these out, made them available to us, that was September the 1st. And uh, they became mandatory for use, but they weren't uh, prom considered promulgated until November. Kind of confusing, but know that there's that's that's the this is the contract. Another reason why I go to Texas Realtors to take a look at it is you notice how this says draft across it. So it'll it's going to show us when we look at these, and this comes in just for you in the future, it'll show us where the changes were made. So the red is the new changes. I mean, the red is the old that's been changed, it's crossed out, the blue is the new change. And anytime, anytime you hear somebody talk about a contract change, know that this is where you can go take a look at it and see what changed. It's easy for sometimes um, an instructor or broker, team lead or somebody will, will say, hey, the contracts have changed and it's paragraph six, they just changed this or paragraph this or whatever, right? But for some of us, maybe in one of them, I want to see exactly what was taken out and what was put in. And that's where this comes into play. Uh, and I always reference it in, in all the classes where we're talking about contracts so that people understand where that change is and what was changed specifically in it. Uh, and again, so here, for example, they added the addendum for the uh, public improvement district where an individual is required to pay because of the public improvement district or public assessment. All right, so that's that's on the one to four family contract. Always know that the upper right hand corner, if it's a promulgated form, the upper right hand corner will give you the date that it was promulgated. And it's really important because uh, when we make the changes, like for example, when I when I click on a contract, the very first thing I do is I look at that date. And especially once we made the changes, and we started using the new ones, I automatically look for the date. I know that we have the wrong contract or the right one and, um, and so forth. And you will have people using the wrong contract. That's gonna happen because of some of the things we talked about this morning as well. All right, so one of the other things I wanna show you in here is again, we're underneath legal and ethics and we click on forms. This is texasrealestate.com, texasrealestate.com. If you scroll down here, there is a form description and reference. Form description and reference. This is also available in zip forms. In zip forms, if you go to the search, click on forms, you go to search and just type in FDES, like Fox, Delta, Echo, Sierra, FDES. This will come up, it's form description and reference. And I shared this one with you because it gives you every form available. There's over, last time I counted, there's 176 forms available. But more importantly, it tells you how they're supposed to be used. Like, for example, if you have a listing agreement and it's a condo, that all you have to do is you do the exclusive right to sell and you attach this addendum to it to make it a condo listing. But it'll tell you exactly how they're used. Seller's disclosure. It's designated to be used or designed to be used because of the Texas property code. And it's for one residential dwelling, which is a question I get from time to time. Can I, do I use the seller's disclosure for, for a fourplex? There's not anything for a fourplex. Can you use it? I would say yes, I've used it. But uh, I've used it where I've made one for each apartment. I've made one for the, had to ask the sellers to make one for the entire complex. But it's designed for one residential dwelling. Residential dwelling. Sellers disclosure notice, right? And it complies with paragraph seven 
of the TREC forms, which is the contracts. And that's the one that says if they don't have it, they're going to get it. Once they get it, they have seven days to terminate. And we'll talk about that one here in just a second. Uh, it also addresses they may need to update the property condition, right? So this, this is form description and reference. And again, the reason I'm showing it to you is because it will answer a lot of questions about forms and what to use and how to use it. For myself, I use control find on it all the time. Go back in, take a look at it. Um, let's see what they say about it. This is put together by Texas Realtors, not TREC. RFC is residential, farm and ranch, and commercial. So the intermediary notice can be used for all three of those. Mr. Goes, how I can find that? Sorry. How I can find that, that document? This document is in, um, uh, it's in zip forms. If you go to forms and just type in FDES, or, okay, yes. or you can go to texasrealestate.com, texasrealestate.com, and just click on, um, I am bold, don't worry, sir. Mm. Go to texasrealestate.com and just click on form description and reference. Perfect, Under, thank you. Underneath legal, legal and ethics, go to, go to forms and then click on form description and reference. Um, thank you. Yes, ma'am. One of the other things that it does do is it shows you actual, and you don't need to know these, but people will reference sometimes, oh, you need TXR 1102, right? So what, what is that? Um, so you can go in and find it that way as well, pretty quick. I wanted to show you that it actually covers all forms that are recognized by Texas Realtors. So that's the promulgated from TREC and the forms that Texas Realtors put together. Every, all of that's going to be in here. And, and the main thing is it tells you how to use it or what it's used for. Right? Anybody have any questions there? No, thank you. All right. So the, um, so the other thing I want to show you on this one, oops, let me back this up. If I go in here, legal and ethics, and go to blank form downloads, I was clicking on forms. We're going to go to blank form downloads. You'll also see that we have forms in English, Spanish, and Vietnamese. On these forms that are in, and not all forms are, are converted over, but the main ones are, right? If I go to Spanish, for example, I can lay that next to the actual form I'm going to be using, but I can't use it as a contract. It's designed so that the consumer if I have a consumer that reads Spanish, for example, it might be beneficial to lay that next to us so they can see what it is they're filling out. So they, or they understand what we've filled out for them uh, and are asking them to initial and sign. And again, that's just right here on the right-hand side. And again, not all forms are in there, but the majority of them are uh, converted. The, one, the majority of the mo most common ones are converted over. All right, and we just added Vietnamese in there last last year, actually. Any other questions or comments about that one? No. All right. So we are going to go to the um, forms. Right. We'll do it this way. There's actually uh, uh, the idea here would be to walk through some of this for, for you. If you have any questions about it, I'll hit some of the highlights. You can take some notes uh, as well. When the schedule was put, to, put together, one of the things I had on here was um, when Norman and I talked about it was actually at this point, at the end of this class, for you to fill out a one to four family contract and the agenda that you think you need with it for your situation, just create one. You're, let's say you're buying your property or you're buying a property and submit that and let's do a quick review on it and make sure that we have everything filled out the way we're supposed to. 
when we're doing these live, that's the way we would do it. I'd actually hand these to you and have you fill them out right quick in the class. And the classes were taking an hour and a half to two hours to do. Uh, but we're not going to do that via Zoom. I'm going to leave that up to you. You submit it to me. I'll, I'll go over it with you or review it and send you notes back on it so that you, you have that. Uh, if that's something that might be beneficial to you, please do that. Parties. When we talk about the parties, um, whether you have the buyer or the seller, when the, once again, we want to make sure that we have the right party. So if we're on the listing side, we want to make sure that we actually ask Take a look at the tax records and make sure that the person we're talking to is the person that's on the tax records. And if they're not, find out why, right? So make sure that we have the right parties. Uh, if you're representing the buyer, we've talked about that. We might wanna ask for identification, driver's license, passport, something that says who they are. So we make sure that we have the right person. When you're filling out the contract, the one to four family contract or the promulgated forms, um, Paragraph two, paragraph two is the property. Lot and block is really important. Some of you may remember the, the uh, term in pre-licensing homogeneity, meaning that there's no two pieces of property the same, right? And that's based on the lot and block. When you go lot, block, subdivision, they're all different. We may have two streets the same, Name the same. Zip code's probably going to be different, right? Two streets the same, but zip code's different. But so is the lot block and the subdivision. You're not going to find uh, them to be 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 the same. The um, so really quick on this. As we're doing this, lot and block is something we should be filling out. If it's a condo, it's going to be a unit. Right here, where it says known as. We're talking about the address and the zip code. Address and zip code. It doesn't need to have 123A Street, Harlingen, Texas. All it needs is 123A Street, 78550. You don't need the city because you already have the city up here, right? And some of this is, um, should be the same thing you had when you took pre had taken the pre-licensing classes. Improvements, when we talk about improvements, please keep in mind that when we're talking about improvements, we're talking about um, you have the, the land, right? You have the land and then you have land with improvements and then you have um, the property rights, bundle rights. Well, improvements is anything we've done to the land. If we've added, because I'll have individuals say the property only has a, a small shed on it. Do I need to use the one to four family or can I use the uh, unimproved property, unimproved property contract? Which one do I use? If there's improvements on it, then we should probably be using the one to four family, right? Because that's what we're focusing on is the improvements. The, uh, some of the other little things that come up with this one, it addresses permanently installed and permanently installed sometimes can be confusing when we talk about kitchen equipment. Kitchen equipment. Generally speaking, when we talk about permanently installed, that's going to be the stove, the range, the, the built-in uh, oven. Even if it's a, a freestanding stove or range, right, where you have the oven and the burners on the top, and that's considered built-in in most cases because it has a tip-over screw that's bolted into the floor, into the wall. So when the door's down, if a, if a child was to get on the door, then it's not gonna tip over, right? That kind of, kind of thing. Um, but a refrigerator is not built in. For a refrigerator to be built in, what Texas Realtors has on it is that uh, the front doors, the front doors of that refrigerator should match the cabin cabinetry, right? So it should go with the cabinets uh, for it to be considered built in. A couple other areas where we might hit uh, some issues, depending on the area you're, you're working with, window air conditioners, sorry, window air conditioners 
are actually considered accessories and should stay with the property. We've talked about recently, we talked about um, pools, hot tubs. If it's an above ground pool, it should be staying with the property. Now these items down here where it says accessories, according to this contract, they should be staying with the property. However, I will tell you my practice, our practice has been over the years, if a buyer walks through the house and says, I really like that, I'm gonna make a note of it. If they write up an offer, if we write up an offer on that property where they liked whatever it was, I'm, and it's one of those accessories or anything else that's not attached, I'm going to do a non-realty items addendum. So when I say attached, please remember that right here where it says mounting, mounts brackets for televisions and speakers. The, the mounts form stay because they're attached to the wall, but not the TV, not the television, not the speakers. Um, so that needs to be broken down. And so again, if a buyer walks through and says, I love that big screen, can we negotiate for it? Sure, but it's probably not going to be considered attached and it's probably gonna go with the sellers. So we need to talk about it. That's where the non-realty items addendum would come into play. The same thing with anything else that's in here. Um, just recently, there was one about a hot tub within the company. And if there's a hot tub outside on a slab, it's plumbed, it has water going to it, it it's not necessarily attached by itself, right? So I would do a non realty items addendum to make sure that it goes there. This says um, that the pool would stay, of course, pool, pool uh, equipment. You have the above ground pool, the swimming pool, equipment, et cetera. It's supposed to be staying there. But if there's any questions, non realty items addendum will, will eliminate those issues. I'm going to hit some of the bullet points. If you have any questions, please jump in. Exclusion, exclusions. If there's any exclusions in, in the contract, um, anything the seller is going to retain, maintain, uh, keep, make sure that we actually put that in there so we don't have any issues there. And three on, on three, the sales price. One of the areas that gets missed from time to time is checking these little boxes right here. If there's financing involved, then I need to have numbers in three A, B, and C, but B should be marked, one of the boxes should be marked. Can more than one box be marked in three B? And the answer to that is yes, because it's very easy. You could very easily have third-party financing and seller financing on the same transaction. In fact, there was one just approved the other day for that. And on four, on paragraph four, residential leases, fixtures. If you're not sure what these are and you have questions about it, ask somebody. If if the buyer is buying a house that has a tenant in it, there's a residential lease, so this should be marked. If they're buying a duplex and they're gonna live in one side and rent out the other and there's a tenant already there, then we should have a residential lease. If they're buying a fourplex, four apartments, three of them's empty, but somebody's living in one, we should have a lease attached, right? Um, I've talked to Norma about this. I've only seen a couple transactions, uh, less than a half a dozen, since this contract came out where we actually had residential leases marked. One of the problems with this is if I mark it on here, then it says that I need to provide the addendum regarding the residential leases. And that addendum says I have to provide a copy of the residential lease to the buyer. So understanding the, the forms and the way they go together. So in this case, I need to copy the lease I need the addendum and I need to win the four family contract with 4A marked to make all of that work. Paragraph five, one of my favorites. Paragraph five, when we talk about title company, the buyer must deliver to what goes in here? 
What goes in this first blank? The name of the title company itself. Yes, thanks, Vanessa. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Not a person's name. Not a person's name. And um, you will see offers come in on your properties where they have a person's name in there. And what I would recommend, I got this from Texas Realtors, what I would recommend is if the seller is going to make changes to that, to that offer, make that change as well. Agents will tell you the reason they put the person's name in there is because that's who they want to be the uh, closer at the title company. That's not where it goes. And there's, there's liability issues with that. It says the buyer must deliver to. So if I put Mary Sue in here, right, then the buyer's delivering that money to Mary Sue, not to Stuart Title. And then when the buyer terminates and they want the earnest money back, we would send the release to Stuart Title. But if there's a problem, that opens up Mary Sue for um, issues because her name's on the contract. As far as the consumer is concerned, on paper, she received the earnest money. And it wasn't her, it was the title company. And the attorneys from Texas Realtors has addressed this a couple of times, but for whatever reason, people still continue to put a person's name in there. We don't want to do that. And at, we want the address, we want the actual specific address of the title company. Earnest money, option money, make sure that we keep those separate. Know that know that earnest money and option money can be delivered at the same time. There's not a problem with that. Uh, same check. They're going to separate it out, option money first, then earnest money. That's the way it's supposed to be done. They don't always do that, but that's the way it's supposed to be done. It's our job to keep an eye on the title company, make sure they're doing things the way they're supposed to. Because believe it or not, they don't always do that. Termination option. How many days go in here? Anybody? Is it seven? Wait, no, because of the option, it's three days. All right. So Wait, you have three, I'm sorry, I'm confused. You have three days to deliver. Right. Yeah. Days yeah. To deliver. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Thanks for jumping in there. They, uh, you have three days to, to receipt the earnest money and the option money. You have three days to get that receipt over the title company. Um, and that can be, go ahead. I'm sorry. Interrupted. Something that I just learned, which I don't remember from studying, was that if an MLS lists escrow, um, that that is what they're requesting as earnest money. But again, I don't remember that from my studies. Right. So that may be what they're requesting, but there's not uh, in the state of Texas. And the reason you, you wouldn't remember is because it, in the state of Texas, earnest money is not required. Right. Exactly. And what happens is agents try to make it required, and that's not our place to do that. Um, uh, we, and that's one of the things I shared just recently. I actually had an agent from McAllen tell one of one of one of our agents, one of an agent from McAllen told one of our agents that it had to be a thousand dollars earnest money because it has to be at least one um, percent or something like that. And. Uh, uh, our agent had called called me and said, hey, didn't you talk about this? Isn't this? Yes, you don't need to do that. You don't have to do that. It's negotiable between the two parties. There's nothing that says it has to be anything specific. So, But agents will put in there. And that's why, like in McAllen, when we wrote our MLS, I was the MLS chair when we rebuilt our MLS, we took out that option. We don't have an MLS uh, earnest money. Some MLSs have that in there. We don't have that in there because it causes too many problems um, because agents make that decision and, and they shouldn't. If, if it's in MLS, the same thing with a, with a title company. If it's in an MLS, I'll talk to the other, I would call the other agent and say, hey, look, I'm getting ready to write an offer. I noticed in MLS you have um, capital title in there and $1,000 earnest money. Is there a reason for that? And most of the time they'll say, well, that's the title company I like and I want $1,000. Well, you're not a part of this. So usually it's just educating the other side. On the days for option termination, the days for option and termination, the reason I ask that question is because again, that's negotiable. It's negotiable. 
I actually um, seen the longest one I've seen in a while yesterday. Somebody had 20 days on their 20 day option period. So there's no option days are negotiable. So you talk to the buyer and find out what the buyer wants. You and the buyer negotiate that. And then you go to bad form to try to get that. The option fee is required. Earnest money is not. Option fee is required. And sometimes agents will um, try to tie that fee to so many days, like $10 a day or something of that nature. And uh, again, there's no rule for that. So it's negotiable. We've done option fees for 25 bucks. Uh, we've done zero, zero earnest money. It's just understand how the contract works and uh, what's expected. Termination notice. If the contract's going to be terminated, it has to be based on the option. It's going to be terminated based on the option. It must be terminated prior to 5 p.m. on that date. So if, if uh, uh, we had an if we had an offer that went to contract today, so we have initials, signatures, and we communicate acceptance today. So today's going to be the effective date. When does the option period start? Tomorrow, right? Tomorrow. Yes. Okay. That'll be the first day. So tomorrow's day one. When it skips weekends. No, it counts weekends. I'm sorry, it counts. Yes, it yeah. counts weekends. Counts weekends. Every, every day counts. Even if it's the holiday. My gosh, over Christmas and Thanksgiving this year was just absolutely crazy. With love. Yeah, but it's, it's Christmas. I don't care. It counts. We should have taken that into consideration as we were putting the offer together. Um, so you'll hear me talk about with the buyer consultation session. If you're working with a buyer, you need to make sure the buyer has talked to an inspector, make sure they know who they're going to call. So when they walk in that house and go, wow, I love this. After saying congratulations, you might want to uh, tell them to immediately call the inspector and find out when they can get out to the property. Because you need to know that to know what to write in here on how many option days they need. If I put 10 days in there and we've done our inspections and we've gone back to the seller, requested some repairs, but we don't have anything back, then I have to extend the option period for the buyer to still have an option. I'm gonna to have to extend the option period, but that also means the buyer has to pay more and we're gonna use the amendment for that. We're gonna amend the contract, which means the buyer also has to put down additional option money. It doesn't have to be um, a large amount. It doesn't have to be the same amount. It just has to be more than a dollar. And when the seller signs that amendment, they're also signing that they have received that money. So that needs to be something we're doing like right now, not something where we're gonna take care of it in three days or any of that stuff. Any questions on that one? You'll find within the contract, within the company, we actually go over the contracts quite often because, because of little things that pop up every now and then. Um, so a lot of this will be a repeat as we go through it. But uh, once again, if you ever have any questions, don't hesitate to, uh, to get hold of me for it. Um, right here where we have the buyers and sellers, this is on the title policy, it's negotiable. It, it could be at the buyer's expense, seller's expense, expense. The norm is the seller pays for the title policy. That's the norm, but it doesn't matter. It can be either or, or it can be split. If you're going to split it, I would check both of these and then maybe put a comment in um, special revisions, buyer and seller are splitting the cost of the title policy. So we can write business details, material facts and business details, but never if this, then that. On six, eight down here, we talked about this the other day in training. The uh, I would recommend you mark six eight two, right? Where we will amend shortages, and then if I'm the listing agent, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with seller will pay. If I have the buyer, 
I'm probably still going to go with the seller's going to pay it um, because it's a part, in my opinion, a part of delivering everything to the buyer the way they should. That's 5% of the title policy. That's all that costs. 5% of the title policy. So if the title policy is a thousand bucks, you got 5% of that, right? Real easy to work with. Uh, title commitment, that usually is pretty standard. That's not a big deal. One of the things we do need to do is make sure that we get it and then we take a look at it. We need to make sure that the consumer takes a look at it and that their name and contact information, I'm sorry, not necessarily their name, not their name, I'm sorry. Their contact information is in paragraph 21 because that contract says deliver that title commitment and any of the other documents to the buyer and the seller in paragraph 21. We wanna make sure that those documents get there like they're supposed to. This is paragraph 6C on the survey. Probably one of the most misunderstood paragraphs. And in fact, there's brokers, there's a broker McAllen that will not allow her agents to use this paragraph because she says it's too confusing. But this paragraph is real simple. If we have an existing survey, if the seller has an existing survey, I as a listing agent want to make sure I upload it into MLS, make sure it's available for all the other agents, uh, scan it in, upload it, get it in there if possible, or put a note at least a note in MLS saying a seller does have a previous survey, right? So they know about it. If, and, I, and I'd like to have that in my hands, so as a listing agent, if I go to a listing, I'll, I will ask for the survey. If they say it's here in a box, can I get it real quick? If it's upstairs in the attic, I'll probably say, can you get it to me? But I'm going to write down my notes. Um, don't expect it. Because that's I've learned that that's for them to get up in the attic and go through boxes is usually a little too much for them. But right here, if if the seller has the has the survey, we're going to get it and and use it and a T forty seven. So as a listing agent, you'll go in, you actually give them the uh, the T forty seven. You ask them if they have a survey. They say yes, it's in the box. Great. Here's a T forty seven. This is put out, the T-47 is put out by Texas Department of Insurance. It's not a Shrek form. Texas Department of Insurance, because the title company is the insurance company. Title company's insurance, they're offering a title policy. So this is all a part of it, right? So the T-47 needs to be signed and notarized. You give that to the seller, let them go get it notarized and bring it back to you. In fact, my, the verbiage, the specific verbiage for myself was, do you have a survey? Yes. Great, can I get that from you? Awesome. And here's what we call a T47. I need you to take this to a title company or to your bank and uh, get it notarized saying that nothing's changed since you bought the property. And I tell you what, I'll be by in three days to pick that back up. And I always use three days, I always did, because three days after I took the listing, I would go back and have them look at the MLS sheet. Today, things might be a little different with COVID and all this other stuff where we might not want to do that unless we absolutely have to. But if I need to pick something up from them, I'm going to go get it. Um, but today with MLS sheets, you can email it to them, have them take a look at it and tell you whether it's okay or not. You want something in writing from them saying that the what's in MLS is good to go and then put that as a PDF and save it. On this paragraph, the three parts, the first part we've already covered. The second part is if the seller doesn't do that, then the buyer can order it and the seller is going to pay for it. And I'm telling you, this is one, this is the part that gets crazy because if the buyer orders this, the seller is going to pay for it. And we've had sellers say, I'm not paying for it. I don't care who does, but I'm not paying for it. And this is why I will tell you, uh, you, you as an agent, you don't order anything other than the home warranty, the home residential service contract, because you'll, we, I paid for a couple of these, um, not because of this reason, but for other reasons. You don't want to pay for anything unless you have to. But if the buyer orders it, 
It said the contract says the seller's going to pay for it. If the seller refuses, then we could be up a creek, right? So we want to make sure that we've communicated all this properly. The other thing is no later than three days prior to closing. So don't order it the day before because now you've breached this. If I'm representing the buyer, I want to make sure that I do it the way the contract says. So the third paragraph ties right in with the first one. If we get that existing survey and the T47 and they're not acceptable to the title company or the mortgage company, then the buyer or the seller will pay for them. And that's the part that's negotiable if, those, if that's not acceptable. And there's not a existing survey. There's not a timeline on it. There's all kinds of recommendations out there or thoughts about it. If a survey is more than five years, it may not be any good. If it's more than 10 years, it may not be any good. We've used them. Um, the oldest one I've seen used is about 20 years old with no changes. And the title company accepted it. The lender accepted it. No problems. I personally, the oldest one I had was about 10 years old. But um, making sure you understand that paragraph is real important. Everybody good? Yes. All right. So we're going to go to just some other key areas here. Uh, this paragraph 6D right here, the days, you, you need to have some days in here. This gives the buyer the right to object. And if we don't have that information in here, then um, the buyer has absolutely no right to object. So we need to have days in here for them to object. They're going to object to things outside of like the survey. There's something wrong with the survey or the, the uh, um, documents or the commitment or whatever. If you don't have days there, they have no days to object. The other thing is this line right here for activity, nothing goes in there unless it's something specific. Because it says, which prohibit the following use or activity. And if you're a listing agent, you're going to get offers in where they will write in their residential use. And again, we don't do that. It doesn't go there. It says prohibit. If it prohibits residential use, or you think it does, do some research. If it does, then use the right contract. Um, but most people write it in there because that's what they were taught at their brokerage. And that's why we, we don't do that. At the island, Vanessa, you guys at the island sometimes will write in there uh, uh, short-term rentals, rentals. Because if there's a uh, objection to the property being rented out, then we wanna be able to know about that and give the buyer the option to, to get out of it. Because occasionally, you might have a complex where they will not allow, uh, they, they have a certain percentage of them can be short-term, certain percentage long-term, and then um, you have to have the permanent people living in them, right? And if they don't meet those requirements, then that building is no longer allowed to do FHA or VA financing, things like that. So that might be something you wanna write in there if it's, if it's a condo or, or something of that nature. All right, skip to a couple other places here where we have some property condition. Property condition is uh, with the seller's disclosure, for example. The buyer has received the seller's disclosure or has not, and this is what I was referring to earlier, uh, if the seller delivers the notice. So if they don't have it and they get it, they have seven days to terminate for any reason. And they didn't pay for that. That's just... You just gave, gave them a seven day option by not having it. And that's one of my um, pet peeves. How can I write up an offer for a buyer without looking at the seller's disclosure notice? I'm giving them advice and opinions on what to offer. I have no idea what's, when's the last time the roof was replaced or when's the last time you did any work to it? Right? I mean, I could look at it, sure, but you know, what, what's the age of some of this stuff? So I can't plan our strategy without it. And that's why as a listing agent, I absolutely wanted the seller's disclosure up there so the buyer's agent can take a look at it. Once they get it though, if they don't have it, they have that seven days. So please keep that in mind. There are some rules for not furnishing the seller's disclosure notice. And those are in our Facebook groups. 
they um, I put those in there. There's uh, I think about 15 of them total. Things like um, spouses or family or repos or some bank owned properties that it's repos. Things like that will be in there. Buyer accepts the property as is. Every Texas contract for residential, every Texas contract for residential says buyers accepting the property as is. I do not need to write that in special provisions. But the seller said they want it written in there. Then show the seller where it's already there. It, buyer accepts the property as is. If the buyer is not accepting it as is, then they would have two marked and they would have something in here that would pertain to it. And that something needs to be specific and it needs to not be subject to inspections. Not subject to inspections. So for example, if I walk through the house and there's a broken window and the buyer says, I'd like to get that fixed, we can write that in there, right? However, I would probably ask the buyer not to put that in there. Let's do inspections and then negotiate repairs. So let's negotiate the transaction up front, price and terms, and then negotiate repairs and move from there. Don't try to mix them together because if I negotiate price terms and repairs at the beginning, when it comes time for the second one, a round of repairs, the seller might get a little edgy. And then if we have an appraisal that has repairs, we're probably gonna lose the deal. Right, so you want to separate those out. That's just my opinion, but um, always as is. And, and again, you'll have listing agents that will tell you, oh, the seller wants you to write in there as is. You can educate them. Let them know that that's already written in there. You'll probably have to show them where it's at, though, because there's no pictures on these, so most of these people don't read these. <clears throat> Contracts. Sorry about that. The... Um, Residential service contract, that's the what a lot of people refer to as the home warranty. And this is the one that we we're talking about, I believe it was this morning, or maybe it was last week in training. Uh, the buyer purchases it. So this is the only one that I would tell you that you order. You as an agent, get with the buyer, decide what company they want to go to, what they want. If there's any added programs or any added parts to it, make sure we have those in there. That's a, there's a case study from Trek a month or so ago where the buyer's agent didn't let the buyer know that they could have had things like a pool equipment as a part of this. Uh, and most of them offer that. In fact, some of them offer rekeying, pest control, and other things as well. So you lay it out to the buyer. The buyer makes a decision which one they want. And you and or the buyer order that because this does not get paid until closing. So you order it, the invoice goes to the title company. When it closes, the title company cuts a check. You as an agent will need to check to make sure it's on your closing disclosure and then that the check has been cut and sent out. Um, this past year, we had uh, a handful of those where the check was never sent. But that's because we had so many people, even at the title companies, working remotely, right? So that was a part of that because I had not, over the, up until this last year, I'd only seen that happen a couple of times, but this last year is a little different, so. Closing date is on or before, that's not a drop dead date, right? It's on or before. So we can close before that if we want to, which is always a good thing, uh, but on or before, we, we wanna make sure that we, and if we're not gonna close, if today's a closing date, I should have, pro and, and we're not closing, I should have probably done the extension yesterday. And anytime you extend a contract, anytime you extend a contract, if there's financing involved, you're going to also extend the third party financing. And if the third party financing is for conventional, then you're probably going to want to extend the uh, addendum to go with that, the lenders, uh, the addendum to cover the lender and the appraisal, and et cetera, with conventional. A lot of things to keep up with. Yes. A lot of fun, a lot of fun. Yeah. All right, so possession, closing and funding. Just as a note, uh, when we talk about closing and funding, we're generally speaking of uh, they've signed, the buyer signed, seller signed. The title company gets it recorded and the money transfers, right? 
money transfers and they get it recorded. Actually, that's the order. Money transfers and they get it recorded. So we're done. But you do not give the keys to the buyer. Do not give the keys to the buyer until you're absolutely certain it's done. So it's been, the money's transferred, it's been recorded. It's in the new buyer's name. Most of that gets done electronically, but please do not give up those keys. Occasionally there will be a hiccup. So when a buyer says, we're closing on Friday, will I get my keys on Friday? We're closing Friday morning, will I get my keys on Friday? My answer is gonna be, um, I wouldn't count on it, I would plan on Monday, even with everything being done electronically. And when the buyer looks at me and goes, why? It's because we have to wait for it to be recorded and make sure that it gets recorded the way it's supposed to be. And then when we give them the keys on Friday, they'll be happy. I'd rather deal with that than tell them, yes, we're closing on Friday morning. So you'll get the keys Friday afternoon. You'll be able to move in this weekend. And then it doesn't happen for some reason. And not only are they upset, but they've got the U-Haul sitting outside the property waiting to move in. Then you have problems, right? Uh, so I always put that, always put that out. Don't, uh, don't let them do that. And I've been on both, I've been on that uh, where they're sitting outside the property and the agent would actually call and say, I had one here in Harlingen that was really, really nasty. Not the agent, but the buyers. Um, Threatening, threatening me on the phone and everything else. Uh, but they uh, don't let them move in because there's liability issues there, always liabilities. And if, and if you do, you're going to assume that li you're going to assume that liability, not the company. So prorations, you want to make sure you talk to the buyer about prorations and how that works should not be a problem. Make sure the seller understands. If a seller closes today, if they close today, we're in January, right? If a seller was to close today, how is their taxes prorated? Anyone? 31 days in January, you would take that and divide it to see what the amount is for each of the 31 days. And then you would do that from today to the 31st, multiply times the number of days. So it went three, six, nine, 12, 13, 15 days. Okay. So we're actually, we're actually on, on day 17, right? So they owe 17 days because it's through the day of closing. So if we close today, the seller's responsible for today's taxes. Oh, right. Yes. Reverse. Right? Yes. And, and um, um, you know, you there's one of, one of the things that uh, when I was doing pre-licensing, I, was, I would say you take the taxes divided by 365 here. Here's how much it is per day. Now you multiply it times the days that were from January the 1st to through closing day. And, and that way you have it covered. Um, if you're using a system to do that, like title companies have apps to do that. I use Stewart Title all the time. Stewart Title has a, uh, an app on their website where you can go in and just figure all this out. It calculates that for you immediately. So you don't have to do it by hand. Makes it a whole lot easier. But make sure the seller knows that. So if the seller closes, <clears throat> these are their property taxes for this year. Seller closes, these are the property taxes for this year. The seller needs to pay that, right? If we're doing it now. What if they're closing in November? How would you explain that to the seller? I mean, the proration part we've got, Right? That's going to be the same. But what else goes with that? If they're closing in October, November, December, maybe January. So property, property taxes are in the rears, right? So those taxes are not due until the end of January. So they may still owe for last year. They may still owe for last year. If they're close right now, they may still owe for last year. If they close in October, November, or December, if they close in October, November, or December, they may have paid the taxes for that year because in most cases, their financial institution is going to pay for them, right? <clears throat> That's that escrow. So they're, they're going to get paid 
in advance. We pay ours in October because Cameron County offers a discount if you do that stuff, right? Um, if I pay that in advance, let's say I pay it in October and we close in November, then I have a refund coming for the rest of the year. So we're gonna prorate it where the seller is gonna get their money back for what's been paid. And the buyer is gonna get proration on what's due for the rest of the year. Does that make sense? Yes. However, the seller's not gonna get that money from the title company. Just like their insurance, HOA and other things like that, it's going to come from the escrow officer, whoever's handling their, I'm sorry, the escrow company, whoever's handling their escrow. So when they make a payment, all those things are included in there today. You have your, your taxes, your insurance, HOA, all those things are included in your house payment. So that escrow company has that money and the seller is going to get that money back but it might be about three months before they see that. So we need to make sure they're aware of that as well. But they will, they will get it. Get it back. Are we okay there? Yes. I like you're the only one answering, Vanessa. Everybody else just sits there and looks at me. It's like, eh. It's <laughs> Because I used to be a teacher, so I used to get super annoyed whenever my kids would just be, I'd be, just be talking to myself. I was a high school teacher at that, so. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's, I that's... Five years, So I did the COVID teaching and all of that, but I was a speech teacher, so you can only imagine how teaching on Zoom was hard as a speech teacher. It was really difficult. Yes. It was fun. We made it. We made it happen. That's crazy. That's fun. I'm a uh, retired I, teacher. Thank goodness. Awesome. Congratulations. How many years? Which grades? I don't even want to talk about it. <laughs> no. But in Corpus Christi, I did high school, junior high, and elementary. So That's elementary awesome. was my favorite. That's awesome. My mom just retired um, last year. My mom, my aunt, my other aunt, my grandma, my sister, all of them were teachers. So my family's either teachers or doctors. And I was like, I am not going to become a doctor. So teaching was where it was at, but I've wanted to be a realtor this entire time. And so here I'm at. So yeah, congratulations. It's a really nice transition from teaching into real estate, for sure. If you can handle teaching, especially high school, you can do in elementary, you can do anything. I, I, I would not be a high school teacher. For, I was a Marine recruiter. I know how students are in high schools. <sighs> I, I would not want to be a high school teacher for anything in the world. Um, they're either amazing or they're not but then also it's mostly the parents that you have to deal with these days so right yes yeah. Yeah. i had a um in mans this was years ago i had a in, we were in mansfield high school and one of the recruiters that i had working for me somebody mouthed off in a class we'd go into class and give little speeches about how why you should be in the military and etc and he was giving one of these speeches and somebody mouthed off and he reached around grabbed an eraser and bounced it off the kid's forehead oh my gosh <laughs> I was down there the next day begging for everything. Um, just give us some forgiveness here. It's just the Marine way of doing things, you know? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> but our, our daughter-in-law is a uh, principal up in Leander, and, and uh, but she has elementary school. Um, and we talked about, talking about COVID, and she was talking about some of the pro problems that's been created with it, not on the teaching side, but on the employment side even. Because they have the, the pre-elementary in their school, even uh, three and four year olds, I think she said. And there's a daycare right next door. The daycare is paying more and offering a thousand dollar bonus than what she can pay her teachers. So she said it's hard keeping keeping staff in there. Teacher retention was bad before COVID, so it's definitely bad now. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. If we can jump back, jump back in here, um, you will hear me. From time to time, say, if you call and say, hey, I have a problem, here's what's going on, you'll hear me say, yeah, go tell your client to go back to paragraph 15 and paragraph 18. So if you just take the time when you get a chance to read those two paragraphs, if the buyer fails to comply with the contract, here's what's going to happen, right? 
or if the seller fails to comply with the contract, here's what can happen. It's good for them to read that, not me interpret it for them. Let them read it. So they say, I, over the years, sellers had a problem or buyers had a problem. Please go back and read paragraph 15 for me. I'll be over this evening at six o'clock. We'll sit down and we'll talk about it. By that time, they've read it. It's sunk in that it may not be that easy, right? And then the other one is down here on 18, 15 and 18, 15, I'm sorry, 18D, particularly where a seller says, I'm not going to give the buyer back the earnest money. Here's a release of earnest money. I'm not signing it. I'm not going to give the buyer back to that. Back to, I'm not going to give the buyer back the money. I don't care. Um, so take a look at 18D and what it says. Uh, you could be, I mean, you can read it. I'm not going to interpret it for you, but you can see what can happen if you refuse to release the earnest money. Right. I'm sorry, Mac, I had to take a phone call. What was the paragraph right before this that you had mentioned, before damages? 15, default. Okay, got it. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. All right, so then one of the other areas that we have uh, that we need to pay attention to is the, because of our area, is the federal tax requirement for foreign persons. The, uh, if we know the seller is a foreign person, we need to make sure that things are done properly. There's a real good part in texasrealestate.com, legal and ethics right there that has frequently asked questions. You can go ahead and check that out. But if a seller is a foreign national, <clears throat> it says there has to be taxes collected unless it meets certain requirements. <clears throat> and the question that comes up that I throw out all the time when I do contracts is, who's responsible for paying that? Or who's responsible for collecting it? And it says the buyer. The buyer shall withhold. So the buy, it's the seller's money, but it says the buyer is supposed to withhold it. Um, that's why we need to make sure that we're talking about this, make sure that we, we have it covered so we don't have any issues. The, the exceptions to it are the reasons they, they don't have to do it is if it's over, if it's $300,000 there's a, and they're going to use it for their homestead, they don't have to do it. If it's over that, it gives you the breakdown on that in uh, texasrealestate.com's frequently asked questions. Paragraph 21, this is where we need to have their contact information. Phone number, email is all they need. Or if you're going to put an address, you can put their address in here, but we don't need their name, just a phone number and an address. An uh, email address would work for them. Make sure we check the boxes here that are pertinent to the uh, transaction. If we have a third-party financing, if it's going to be attached, we want to check the box according to the attorney with the broker lawyer committee. Uh, Ron Walker said that if I have the third-party financing addendum with the contract, it's with it, but if that box isn't marked on the legal side, it's not a part of it, All right? So you want to make sure you mark the boxes that, are, that go with this. Buyer's attorney, seller's attorney, they always have a choice to, to select an attorney. You do not need to write in here, buyer's choice or seller's choice. You don't need to do that. Of course, it's their choice. Uh, I'm not sure where that's coming from. That's something that just popped up recently. And then of course, the effective date and the signatures. I got a compliment. I got to tell you, Corpus Christi, um, and I wish I, I don't remember who it was, but an agent from Corpus Christi did not have the effective date in here. And I told them what they need to do is do an amendment. The listing agent, buyer's agent, do an amendment. You guys agree on the, on the effective date, what should be the effective date. You get the parties to sign it. Then you submit that to title. Now we have the, if, if we don't write it on here, then we at least now have a, on paper, an agreement as to when that effective date started because that's where everything starts, right? If it is the day after effective date or, um, 20 days after the effective date or whatever it is, everything's based on the effective date pretty much. And we want to make sure that we have that in there. I've told people that in the past, this morning I was checking contracts. There was somebody from Corpus who actually did it. I was so impressed. Absolutely fantastic. Love it. And then back here on this one, on the uh, one to four family, as well, as well as the others, make sure you're marking the right boxes. There's a case study in Trex um, site where the agent marked seller and buyer as an intermediary. The seller, the buyer filed a complaint against the agent. 
the agent said, hell, wait a minute. I wasn't responsible for that. I was only representing the seller. Trek hung them on this right here because that's what he had marked. He did not mark only representing the seller. So they went on the buyer's side and this, he, he was fined and et cetera. Uh, so make sure you're marking the right one. If you're working with another broker, make sure you have the fee in here. This fee should be what's in MLS. If that fee is going to change, we need to know that before, or you should know that before the transaction's written. We should have that ready to go. But please make sure fees in there. We just, our mission office, one of the agents over there did not get paid on the transaction. Did not get paid. <clears throat> she called me. I told her, I said, I, based on what you tell me, I think you're going to be up a creek, but you need to call Norma. And um, the seller, it was her and her family were buying the property, right? And they wrote up, an, they wrote up a, small, a low offer. And the seller accepted the low offer. And he says, because they seen that she didn't want any commission. So they figured, well, since we're not paying a commission, we can accept a lower offer. And his response to, to Norma was, if we knew we were gonna have to pay a commission, we wouldn't have accepted it. So, but please make sure you write that in there. I, again, that's not something, this normally has not been a problem. Normally go by what's in MLS, <clears throat> but it does specifically say that um, it's based on those agreements. So, and then on this last page here, real quick, we talked about the one and four family contract. This time that's in here for the earnest money is real, real important because if the buyer doesn't get the earnest money to the title company on time, remember we have three days, right? If the buyer doesn't get the earnest money to the title company on time, then the seller can terminate. And we've done that twice in the last year. Um, <clears throat> the, um, the buyer has to deliver that within, within the time prescribed, which is three days, right? Unless, unless this is for earnest money and option fee, right? It has to be delivered within three days, unless the third day is a Saturday, Sunday, or a holiday. Unless the third day is a Saturday, Sunday, or a holiday, then you have, then it'll move over to the next day. So if we put a contract together on a, we have the effective date on a Thursday afternoon at four o'clock, we have Friday, Saturday, Sunday, <coughs> excuse me, they actually have until Monday to get that money over there. Monday, close of business. If we put it together on a Thursday at four o'clock, you have Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday's a holiday like today, then they'll have until Tuesday at five o'clock to get it over there. But if I call on Tuesday afternoon about 445 to the title company and say, hey, can you tell me whether uh, uh, Joe actually submitted the earnest money and the option money on 123A Street? No, we don't have it. Then I'm gonna go back to the seller and say, it's not there yet. What do you wanna do? And if he says terminate, then we do a termination. We email it over to the title company. If they don't have it before they close, then your time's up. And tomorrow morning, you bring it in, and the title company says, I'm sorry, that contract was terminated. And we, like I said, we did that twice this last year, one at the, once at the island, once in Mission. And I was involved in both of those. If you don't have it there, it's, it's gone. So please have them write that in. Make sure we're good to go. Anybody have any questions on the one to four family contract? No, but yes, but yes, but no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks. thanks. If I'm being honest. I wish I had an attorney right next to me at all times. <laughs> no, it's... Mm. Yeah, yes, ma'am. They, um, um, one of the, one of the students 